Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to today's Security Boulevard DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap. I'm I'm excited about this one because we have demos and I'm a big fan of demos. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for any of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use the question and answer tab there on your interface and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. We also uh, have a very interactive chat feature. And so I encourage you, if you have a suggestion, comment, whatever for our panelists, please go ahead and just use that chat inter chat tab on the interface there. And uh, we'll take a look at the chats as they come in and uh, maybe uh, actually integrate some of them into the webinar. And then finally, at the end of today's webinar, we are going to be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is why empowering developers is a game changer for application security. Our speakers today are Nicholas Bontu, who is the product marketing manager and former support engineer at Sonar Source, uh, Kirti Joshi, who is the product marketing manager at Sonar Source, and Magic Mansfield, who is a senior product manager at White Source. All of you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. I'm very, very excited, like I said, about this webinar. Lots of great information in therein. And Nicholas, I know you are going to be starting off the conversation. I'm gonna take myself off camera, put myself on mute and let you guys just dive right on into it. All right, thank you, Charlene. Thanks for the nice intro. I'm, I'm pretty pumped up myself now, knowing that indeed we're going to have cool demos, even gift cards at the end. This is pretty cool. But uh, first of all, happy to, to meet you all, to be with you all, to talk about um, application security, uh, developer first, um, you know, what, what are the values we want to talk about today. We're doing a co-webinar where we're pretty happy about that uh, ourselves. As you can see, uh, it's both Sonar Source and White Source uh, joining today to, to talk to you about this. So without further ado, I'm, I'm just going to come back to the quick intros that uh, Charlene shared. Um, uh, indeed, I'm a sonar sourcer, as we say. Clarification is that uh, I come from a development background myself. I have a, a technical background doing software dev, which got me to support engineering and uh, and now doing product marketing to, to share the good vibes of our product and of code quality and code security um, to development communities. And just so you know, I'm presenting right now, um, right by the border of uh, France and Switzerland by, by Geneva. And with me today is also Kirtish, and I will let her say hi. Hey, Kirtish. Hello, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here. Um, similar to Nico, I also started my career in engineering, then moved on to uh, project management. And over the past several years, I have been uh, you know, a product marketer with a majority of it, uh, surprisingly, in the developer tools marketing space. And I'm um, truly passionate about product marketing. And I'm really excited to be here to talk about developer empowerment. Um, I'm based out of Austin, Texas um, in the United States. And most of you all have probably heard it's popularly referred to as the live musical uh, music capital of the world. So here I am. All right. Thanks, Kirti. And we have more people with development backgrounds. So it's, that's what we want to talk about. Uh, and I will soon intro Macek. Um, just so you know, uh, we, so we said we're from Sonar Source. Um, at Sonar Source, we're essentially all about static code analysis. Uh, we could say this is really what drives us since uh, 2008. You might uh, know us uh, for doing Sonar Cube, uh, one of our flagship product. Uh, and we also have you know, um, an IDE extension, some, some cloud services. The goal here is really to help developers uh, uh, scanning uh, their code base for quality and code security. But uh, we'll come back to that later, talk more about this. Just want to let Maciek uh, share a word uh, from where he's joining. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Maciek and I'm joining from Krakow, Poland. Uh, and me getting into white source was actually quite the journey. 
I've been part of cybersecurity industry for many years now. Uh, a while ago, I decided to build something of my own, and that's how Defend was created. And a couple of months ago, Defend was acquired by White Source, and here I am uh, as a senior product manager, still heavily involved in coding uh, and engineering. You can find me on Twitter. The handle is below the map. And if you have any questions after the presentation, you can always reach out to me via my email. That is also here. And since we're on the white source topic, uh, just briefly, white source automates security and compliance workflows and helps developers focus on what really matters. We're doing no false positives, and, and we're really proud of it, and prioritizing vulner vulnerabilities uh, based on their impact. We have a really broad offering for many crucial components. Uh, they're either free or fully open source, so I highly recommend you checking out my work and work of my colleagues uh, after all of this. All right, thank you all. And uh, so why are we together today? I wanna make a, a few clarifications actually, and uh, we, we will all share a few things. The, the first thing is as much as we talked about our respective companies, we're, we're not to talk about, we're not here to talk product uh, announcement or new product integration. Uh, this is not our goal today. The reason we're here together with uh, with Machek, with Kiati is we, even if we are from uh, different backgrounds, different companies, um, we, we have some common values uh, that we try to apply, especially on the application security uh, landscape where, where we are all involved. And, um, and you know, this is really coming from uh, what drives us. Uh, I, I believe for you, Machek is the same as, we're all trying, you know, in our respective places to bring value to, to developers, right? Yeah, exactly. Like Nicole said, we're here today to talk a bit about the security landscape. Uh, all of the crazy buzzwords that are happening, they're flying here and there that you might have heard about. Uh, and the change that is currently happening in the industry, that is the, the shift left approach, uh, incorporation and the idea of putting developer in the center of attention, so making things developer first. Uh, right, Kirti? Yes, absolutely. And honestly, we strongly believe in the value of you know empowering the developers with the right tools at the right place and at the right time so, so that they can actually do their jobs better. And if you think about it, uh, developers naturally value inputs, you know, in a typical development environment, you know, a developer writes code, uh, you know, that code goes through, you know, peer reviews, he checks it in and then continues with the development. And honestly, at every each point in time, if the developer uh, is provided with, you know, high quality tools that provide value and actionable feedback, I think that that's that's a game changer. And it really helps them improve the code quality and security of um, uh, of their delivery. Yeah, exactly. And so basically those are the big topics for today. Uh, as you can see, the first application security. Um, we, we'll start with this. Uh, we want to share a quick landscape with you to kind of share some common, you know, words and, and, uh, and, and verbiage. We've, we've put this little cloud word together. Um, I, I can say for me, for example, when I had to kind of go and, and discover the code security landscape, Suddenly, I was facing all of that, and I was a bit overwhelmed at first because there's there's so many there's so many things there. Uh, I know uh, I know I got some takeaway from that from this, for example. And you know, Maciek, uh, I will let you share. What what is it? The first thing that comes to mind when you see uh, all of those <laughs> together combined? I'm smiling because I I now I now think you you've put it all together to scare people from getting involved, <laughs> you know? It's, just, uh, it's the same problem as getting into web development right now, right? There's so many things happening, so many technologies, and so so it's just, it's, it's becoming overwhelming, and I, I feel yeah. it's not gonna get easier, and when I look at it, uh, that's one of the first things that come to my mind. Uh, when I saw it first, a couple of days ago, uh, I thought about the, ex the United States President Executive Order uh, about cybersecurity. We can we can follow along with that a bit later. Uh, so yeah, so those are the first things. Uh, yeah. Please don't be scared when listening to us or looking at it. Uh, it's not that bad. 
Yeah, and, and we'll clarify it. Uh, I can share, for example, personally, uh, all those acronyms gave me a headache at first, you know, SAST, DAST, SCA. You know, it was like, but I thought it was just security tools, all security tools. And um, and we actually, and this is what we want to share with you, we, we I learned, we learned, and it helped that, you know, we, we can categorize some of those things. So those are different technologies and ultimately the, the use case can be can be various. When you talk about security, you have some, some products or some uh, um, uh, considerations around security of uh, runtime applications. Um, you may have things at the environment level. How do you secure an overall network environment, for example? Uh, there's even processes with compliances and standards. Um, and, and you can start to categorize and, and that actually helps to bring some clarity in that landscape and not just think of you know everything just being security. Um, two more things that uh, comes in this landscape uh, for us is also security of dependencies and security of the code itself. And I will first hand over to, to Matchek here because um, I white source and in, and in Matchek's um, uh, background and, and mission, it's more focused on dependency security, correct? Yes. Uh... SCA, which is software composition analysis, is one of the things that I specialize in uh, from the technical perspective. Uh, as I mentioned, I wrote uh, majority of the different platforms uh, heuristics and detection logic. So that's one of definitely one of the things that were uh, not as important uh, up until last year. All of the events that happened uh, around securing the supply chain and uh, the next thing is. Secure, securing of your code, uh, and I'll pass to Nico on that one. Yes, because that one is a different technology, so this would be more an, another yet another acronym, uh, SAST, S-A-S-T, so that one stands for Static Application Security Testing, and, and, and this is where we would focus, so it's really the code that, um, the, 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 the business logic that you're writing, the code that your dev teams are writing, is there some vulnerabilities potentially introduced by the logic itself of that code or by the, the code patterns uh, present right there um, and independently of whatever comes from the dependencies. So we wanted to share this because we, we hope it helps kind of provide some clarity into, you know, what is all those different things that would come under security. Uh, but it also, it's also a mean for us to say that, hey, yes, Matchek may be focused on SCA, maybe Kirti and I may be focused on, on SAS in terms of value we want to, to um, um, uh, functionality we want to offer to developers. But we do have common values that we're here to talk about. And, and this is about empowering developers. This is this, this developer first approach that uh, we're going to take the time today to, to demo and to articulate. Because you know we think it's truly it's truly impactful when you take the time to consider it to not just think of security tooling but of really thinking of what is it you're trying to achieve, and also take a few words about you know what a game changing approach it is uh, that we believe it is. Um, hence the hence the title of this uh, of this webinar today. So you know what? Let's let's dive right in. Um, Kirti Machak and I want to show you first. What do we think it takes to achieve developer first uh, from your perspective, but also from, from our perspective and, uh, and what are the greater impacts? But for that, we need to take a look at how developers work today. And it's cool because we have somebody who was probably coding a, a few hours ago, barely. So, so Maciek, what's, you know, where, where, where are developers? Tell us, tell us where you're spending your day as a developer and what's driving you as a dev. Yeah. It's, if you think about it, that's actually a really good question for for a shift left approach, right? Uh, we try to yeah. sh shift as close as we uh, to get. We try to get as close as we can to the developers' uh, workplace. I would say uh, we try to be with them uh, twenty four seven, wherever they are and whatever they do, uh, work wise, obviously. Uh, and if you think about it, how the development process looks and what developers do and who they are, you can see a picture of people that are being constantly distracted. Uh, they live and breathe in their code repositories, right? Yet they're being pulled away constantly. Uh, throughout my career, I've noticed uh, that me and my friends mostly complain to our managers on one thing, uh, distractions, because developers, they love learning new stuff. Uh, 
Many of them enjoy pair programming, not all of them, but they definitely enjoy sharing knowledge and they're open to learning new things. They're open to getting a uh, constructive feedback for their pull requests for their work. They want to learn, they want to grow. They're just interested in becoming better. Uh, yeah. And all of that, when it is combined, uh, and when you add up on top of that distractions, that becomes a really big problem. Uh, what do you think about it, Kirti? Yes, and I agree. One of the other things that I wanted to also add is that you know developers love to try tools, and you you know mentioned about you know the shift left approach, and uh, if those tools are kind of you know open source, even better, right? And not only do they like to try it, but they like to share it too. And um, I've realized that if a developer loves the tools, they are actually the strong advocates for that tool. And so, you know, in our mission to empower the developers, I think both our companies, you know, White Source and Sonar Source are, you know, true believers of open source. And some of our you know, products are even open source and free uh, to use. For example, the Sonar Lint product is a free and open source ID, Sonar Cube. Uh, has a open source and free edition, and so really, you know, in this, we as enterprise enterprise um, prizes, you know, are strong proponents for that for the open source and the value it brings. So I think that's another uh, aspect of it as well. Yeah, and that's a big problem yeah. sometimes yeah, and for too the much business exploit and the developers. <laughs> Sorry, they use their own tool. Yeah, yeah, they they keep they keep adding more stuff. True. Yes, and 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 what we're going to talk about uh, as we go forward is, um, you know, there's this. It might it seem like a paradox that they don't want interruptions, still they value good feedback, but actually that's that's the sweet spot we want to talk about. Of, you know, developers, if you think about it, naturally they they really open up for input. You know, they submit pull requests, they ask their peer for feedback, so the tools have a role to play there. But you know, it has to be quality feedback. It has to be quality input. So what we're going to uh, illustrate uh, moving forward is what is this um, those kinds of value that we can. Um, bring uh, as uh, products uh, that, that are aiming for developer first uh, on application security, but also what is it uh, that you can reasonably expect uh, when, when you're considering AppSec tooling uh, to maximize impact. And first thing here uh, is to use um, Machek's word. Um, you talked about distractions. Uh, uh, we at Sonar Source like to talk about noise. We often say kill the noise, minimize the interruptions. Um, and this is really the idea that, you know, if you're trying to enable your dev teams with security tooling, your dev team is going to expect, you know, quality input and not, uh, uh, you know, high uh, noise to signal uh, ratio um, of, of having to filter through too many things. Um, one thing we're doing at Sonar Source, for example, to um, to address that concern is we introduced a distinction between what we call the, an actual security vulnerability and a security hotspot. So kind of a new concept, uh, but we thought that it didn't make sense to mix them all into security issues um, because then it would give an indication that, okay, everything needs action. But in fact, not everything needs immediate action. If you compare those two uh, Java code examples here, um, you know, I've, I've hidden a few bits, but uh, I'll reveal them soon. Um, the example on the, on the left is, you know, uh, um, a cryptographic key being used, which is too weak. And the intent here is to clearly say, no, you have to fix this because the world knows how to crack those keys and you got to use a stronger key. But if you look on the right, it's, it could be called a security issue as well, right? Because when you manipulate cookies in a web application, you do not want to put any sensitive data in this cookie. However, throwing a red flag for this uh, would be quite noisy for a dev because the dev is just using a cookie in his web app. I mean, that's a that's a totally fair use case. Uh, but the, the intention here is to tell the developer, hey, be careful because depending on the kind of uh, data that you put in this cookie, you may be exposing yourself to a risk. And so this is where we're doing this split between security vulnerabilities, needs an immediate code change and fix, security hotspot needs a code review. Developer gets feedback just from the looks of the feedback. He understands, okay, now I really got to do something or, okay, this is this is to review maybe with a peer to understand the, the logic. And again, sure, it's a nice UX, but the point here is that if we were to mix this, 
then the developer at some point would start to say, oh, but one out of three times, it's something that doesn't require immediate action. So I'm, I'm going to start to ignore it, right? The, Maciek, you end up ignoring stuff, right? If there's too much noise or if there's uh, poor feedback from a tool. Don't. Yeah, we had this, we had this discussion. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> keep ignoring everything that is noisy because I do not see a value in, you know, 100 messages popping out with each pull yep. request. I prefer yep. to have it prioritized and uh, yes. well presented. So. Yeah. All right. I'll let you share another example you have about uh, context awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I strongly believe in. Uh, any tools that developers use should be aware of the, the context in which uh, the developer is working at the moment, right? Whether it's a development process, testing process, or production, or any other stage. Uh, and it also applies to dependencies. Uh, majority of the of the languages have this deficient that you have production dependencies, you have development and, and testing dependencies, you might have QA, uh, quality assurance and deployment dependencies and other dependencies, right? So uh, what I've implemented in, in Defend is and like the awareness of where we are in the development cycle, what stage it is. Uh, so you don't end up getting pager duty calls in the middle of the night. Uh, from your production system about some like high security CDE that isn't affecting your production, right? Uh, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be fixed. I, I'm, I'm not saying they aren't urgent, but the question is, are they worth waking up people in the middle of the night when the business is actually not at risk? So that's, uh, that's my point here that all of the, all of the tooling that the developers use, obviously within the, their context of work, uh, should be context aware. They should understand uh, the severity of the issue, and it, they should try to correlate it with uh, with, well, with waking up developers. Uh, Nico, I, I guess you don't like me woken up in the middle of no, the night, right? I do not. I do not like. Uh, I do not let uh, false uh, false positives. Uh, we 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 have this saying sometimes as Sanasos that um, when when you're trying to be super careful with developers' expectation you may want to lead towards false negatives more than false positives because a false positive is you bring up something to the dev and 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 it's actually you know not true false negative is it was there was maybe something but you didn't bring it to the dev so sure you know there there could some really something there could have really been something in there uh, but from a tool development perspective you know it's we prefer working on precision detection etc to then bring only quality issues Rather than bring more issues, but then the developer has to um, has to triage. Um, yeah, I, I guess right, we so, need so to that's always good. wait, yeah. right? The the outcome yes. and the potential risks. Absolutely, yeah. So so that was the part about minimizing noise, and and we also want to talk about how it's important to do that in the context of the developer workflow. So you could think of minimizing noise being providing the right data, and the developer workflow is also at the right time and in the right place. Um, because uh, you, you talked earlier quickly about you know what developers uh, do you know day in day out magic and and this is typically what it what it would look like right uh, starting from version control yeah so one thing that I guess we both noticed uh, both both our companies notice is that uh, there is this typical understanding of the development process flow right you you, you start kind of start with a version control uh, you go with the continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, continuous deployment. If stuff is blinking, that's that's uh, weather outside. Uh, so yeah, and and then there's production, right? And de develop people that design the development process flow. So they tend to think that way. That okay, we have we have those software engineers doing stuff. Our work starts when we ship it. Uh, but I guess this is not how, how we all see uh, the development flow, right? Right. And a couple of things to kind of add here is uh, the software developer is not at the side 
on the top anywhere else actually the software developers is at the center and then the focus in the entire process so, right from you know writing codes or uh, delivering that code through you know ci cd processes through like qa security review what have you uh, the developers involved in every you know aspect of it and uh, feedback loop every time and uh, like we mentioned before with the right tools you're equipping them with you know the quality the insightful feedback uh, right away so uh, i think i think that's that's an important factor to all the whole renewed focus on uh, the development process and yep. another thing yeah that uh, if you go to the next slide yeah another thing that it's it's kind of interesting is um, in fact you know a developer's first connection with code if you think about it is through their id and um, we strongly believe that it's also their kind of you know first line of defense for delivering secure and um, quality code and different i mean developers prefer their ides vs code intellij what have you and most of the native id capabilities like do a good first pass at enabling developers to deliver that quality code uh, and when they you know take those native abilities and combining combine them with you know third party plugin tools uh, like sonalent or other tools i mean they are able to get that you know high coverage and confidence in the code uh, that they deliver so i think this would be a good point where i can you know just demonstrate uh, what i mean uh, in a simple demo here so <clears throat> Here's a simple example uh, that I have. Uh, it's a, a code snippet which I opened up in Visual Studio Code. Um, I have Sonar Sources, uh, Sonar Lint plugin here installed as one of the linting tool for code quality security. And um, if you look at it, I mean, um, I'm generating an async encryption decryption key pairs, very similar to the example Nico showed uh, a little while ago. And here, if you look at it, like the key pair generation has you know 2048 bits we are using you know the rsa encryption algorithm and so if i'm a developer i don't know much about it i basically instead of you know using a, a larger key value if i use you know a 512 you see that the tool you know instantly puts in this you know interesting squiggle here and uh, so that squiggle is very is analogous to you know a squiggle that you see in a word processing document. If you make a mistake with a spelling, uh, it's going to squiggle that, so you know right away that's a that there's an issue here. And so digging it uh, a little bit deeper into this, uh, I open up the description here. It tells you that oh, cryptography keys should be robust and um 512 is not really robust here so it's a security vulnerability it flagged uh, of severity critical and it gives you a you know, right in context help uh, instant remediation guidance right here in the id itself so you need to use you know a, a key of 2048 bits or higher so if i change it you know back to a much higher you see that the error is immediately gone and not only that, uh, detecting issues, it's also, you know, providing that in-context uh, guidance that I kind of mentioned. And here with the rule descriptions, uh, you see an example of a non-compliant code, just like we have here. And, um, you know, a compliant solution. So right here, this is how you would fix it. And so I think, you know, this kind of in-context help uh, is very empowering because this is shifting the problem, you know, as left as you can. Uh, you, you, you know of the issue right away, you fix it, boom, voila, done. Um, uh, and so, I mean, uh, one thing that it's interesting here is that it's uh, security is not just, you know, the AppSec team's responsibility now, right? It's kind of co-owned by the developers. And uh, if you have tools, uh, that flag these right up front. I think you're 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 in good shape and at least can deliver code with some level of confidence. Um, yeah. Another just quick one that I wanted to kind of show here is uh, um, uh, an example of a uh, example of a bug. So we see a squiggle, a lot of squiggles here, and we open up the rule, um, and it basically shows you that this is a bug it's a critical severity so yes you need to address it look at it um, it says that oh jump statement should not occur in a finally block because um, if you use those statements then it's going to um, 
you know not handle the runtime exception correctly in a try catch block that you put in there so uh, an immediate you know remediation uh, immediate thing that you can do is you know you you can just remove remove that return statement from from the block right away here hola i think all the squiggles have mostly gone we can look into it in details but here you know that you know you're safe your code is you know safe um, to deliver now yeah nice very nice and this is this is as you code so i think one of the points we're trying to show is you no know, it's it's not about feedback that was previously somewhere else and that we're bringing to the id is first making sure that you can get live feedback directly within the id and <laughs> be sure from a performance standpoint etc it you know it has to be at the at the level in order to provide that feedback and then it it follows all along the workflow so i could complement that quickly by showing uh, you know, you may be familiar with um, GitHub pull requests. You know, this is um, a conversation, a pull request being submitted. And the intent would be to provide similar kind of feedback directly in a pull request. For example, hey, you, you have, you know, in this case, it's all green, all checks have passed. Or in another, in another case, you know, you could look at checks more in details and it would be saying, okay, in that case, it actually found a vulnerability. So really this idea that at each step of the workflow, uh, providing quality feedback to know whether uh, new issues are being introduced. And uh, I believe, uh, Matchek, right, you also have similar kind of, of input for pull request analysis. Oop. There you go. Let me just show. Oof, do we have Machek with us, or did we lose Machek? Hmm. It seems like we lost Machek. Charlene, can you confirm? Uh, and I can anyhow proceed forward. No problem with that. I am checking right just now. Yeah, it looks like he dropped, unfortunately, but hopefully he'll be right back. Um, if you yes. want to go ahead and move forward, and then we'll get him in as soon as he comes back. Yes, no problem. Uh, he 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 shared in the chat that there was a heavy storm in uh, in Krakow. So let's let's just hope it's uh, not too not too heavy. Okay. So pull request analysis, you know, building on top of uh, ID feedback uh, is is really kind of the typical examples of those tools have to provide feedback directly in the workflow. Um, so that the developers have the again the right data at the at the right uh, time in the right place. Uh, something extra we wanted to talk about is then the guidance uh, provided to developers. Um, you know, we 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 really think developer first is sure. It's it's about giving the providing the opportunity for developers to find and catch issues as they work. But finding an issue is, is just the first part. <laughs> then the expectation would be that the developer gets a chance at fixing it. And, and fixing an issue actually requires uh, quite an understanding sometime, depending of, uh, of what is going on. Um, I can share an example of that really soon. Um, but you know, if, if you really try to bring this to the, to the full extent, it's how do you make sure the developer then has all of the information to understand in depth and uh, and work on a fix. Let me um, let me share an example for that, and uh, also hoping we'll get Matchek back soon. All right, here is an example of a vulnerability reported by uh, SonarCube in this case. Uh, Sonar um, Kirti demo SonarLint. We showed the white source pull request analysis. This is an OS command injection uh, vulnerability. So basically what the tool is saying here is that, hey, in this specific line where a, commanding, a command is executed, um, there's, there's, a, there's a vulnerability that can be exploited because an OS command is being executed and, they, and it has user input in it that has not been um, sanitized. If a developer would only have feedback on this line 17 right here, it would actually take, you know, half an hour, potentially even hours, to then trace back where does that user input actually come from? How am I manipulating it in my applications? And this is where, again, tools have to provide this kind of valuable guidance. Uh, and in that case, you know, the UX kind of walks the developer through the vulnerability. So it starts at number one. It says, OK, you're getting a parameter here. You're, you're putting it in a variable. You're decoding it, putting it in another variable, and you can truly trace what we call the data flow. How is the data flowing in your application? And understand that, oh, there's a function call made in another file, 
and you're building the command at this point and then you're executing it. And with this information at hand, the developer can start to have an informed thinking process of like, okay, if I'm supposed to sanitize my user input, what is the best place to do it? Uh, how can I strengthen the code so that I'm not going to have such a pitfall, you know, uh, in another two months from now? And also try to understand, okay, what what are the best practices that I need to lo learn uh, on the long term? Um, so, so again, this this really speaks about providing remediation guidance to to, to developers. Let me make a quick check if we have a chance of seeing Machek again, but uh, we we have not right now. Um, Charlene, just to check, I suppose I, I can continue. And uh, can you just ping me back if you see uh, Machek coming back up? I, I do see him on the back end, but it looks like he might be having some trouble with his camera. Oh, wait. Oh, there he is. All you right. hear me? Perfect timing. Awesome. Yes, yeah, we, we can, can hear you, Machek. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm so yeah. sorry. There's a huge thunderstorm here, and uh, something got hit near me, and it just turned all of the stuff. Oh, so oh, no. uh, okay. Uh, You're safe. We can uh, let's continue as far as we can. Just so you know, I was talking about uh, remediation guidance uh, and and how we help developers not just find issues, but at least get a chance to understand them and get documentation about it, so that they know mm -hmm. you know how to fix it. Because the point is to actually solve uh, issues. So I, I think we can move forward because you you had a you had a, a, sh a strong point you wanted to bring, Machek. This kind of wraps up um, expectations that you know you as a, as an audience today you you can truly have towards AppSec tooling if you really want to empower developers to use that tooling. Um, it's it's again that you know the tool should provide accurate actionable feedback in the dev workflow with helpful guidance. You know we are here to say that this is what drives us at White Source and Sonar Source, uh, but but for good reasons because we believe this is truly what developers expect and uh, and and what you can expect as well. Um, and before the storm gets uh, bigger in, in Krakow, uh, we, we want to take five, 10 mi more minutes to talk about benefits, um, big benefits that we think this is unlocking. And, um, and you know, the first thing we want to touch base on is incremental improvements. Machek, you, you, we had this discussion. It's, it's super important for you that, you know, there's, there's an incremental approach to um, uh, getting on top of, of code security. Can you, can you take yeah. on this? I think so. <laughs> Unless something happens again, I'm really sorry. The independent, uh, no problem. everything went down. Even even like my mobile connection, uh, crazy. I, I, I you can probably hear that uh, through my microphone a bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so one thing that I that I really appreciate when when I start, for example, a new job in a, in a legacy software is are tools that understand that I won't be able to achieve this perfect state. You know, I'm not starting from scratch. I do not start a new project with all of the things up to date, all of the things nice and, and like shiny. Uh, and I would expect my tools to kind of understand that and help me, if not improve, that then at least prevent the quality and security degradation of things that I do. And this is how I see stuff. Uh, sometimes I need to do, uh, I need to take shortcuts. I'm willing to do that uh, for many reasons, but I want to to have this, this feeling that, hey, I can get to all of the things I can catch up uh, unless they're like really, really critical. Uh, and this is what I wanted to show you today uh, in, a, in a short demo. <laughs> That really crazy. If I could turn my camera, you could see how, how crazy it is outside. In a uh, lightning demo. <laughs> lightning yeah, demo, yeah. yeah. It, it isn't a lightning talk, but it's a lightning demo now. Uh, so let me let me share my screen for a second. Mm. Oh yeah, now you can see me pinging in the internet connection. So let's clear it. Uh, so the the, the way. Uh, White source different works uh, in regards to being context aware is the understanding that not everything is great from day one, uh, but allowing me to go with that. So just for people that don't know Ruby, uh, bundle install is just a command that installs the dependencies. Uh, and different understands as a tool that I don't have a clean slate. I 
have a state with some problems. I have a score, I have some CVEs, but what, what it does, it prevents me from deteriorating. Uh, I have a gem that isn't of a best security nor quality. And whenever I try to install something that would go against uh, the company policies or that would make the project worse, it's going to stop me from, from doing that. It's basically just going to prevent me from, uh, from even downloading a package like that. Uh, so I, if I'm not able to make things better, I'm at least not making things worse for myself and uh, all my colleagues from the, from the company. And this is how I, uh, this is how I see uh, this part of the, uh, yeah, we feel the, the, you know, shifting left. Yes, we and, and we feel the same on our side. Is that you know, if, if you take a, a a dev team and you say, okay, starting from now on, uh, we're going to pay attention to security, and the starting point is we figured out there is already two hundred security issues, and you have to fix all of them. There's going to be an epidermic like reaction in the team of like. <laughs> Okay, but you know, this is the past. You know, this is so many history there. Where does it come from? What does it take? It would be an it could be an endless sprint of you know, like tunnel effect trying to to fix the depth. Whereas you know, we also believe you know, uh, the powerful approach um, is to you know, and, and this is to build on top of what you said, uh, Machek is is to um, kind of trigger developer accountability, which in terms is going to enable some growth. Um, we have this thing which we call um, clean as you code, this, this concept, and it's precisely this. It's say, okay, the contract is that starting from today, the code that you will write or modify should meet these expectations that we are setting at the team level. You may have some issues in past code. Okay, if there are some serious ones, maybe we should look at them. But otherwise, this depth, you're going to go through it uh, over time and, and and to resolve it as you code and as you refactor the code. And this is a fair contract for developers, right? If you tell a developer, hey, look, starting from tomorrow, pull request, you know, meet those expectations that you decide as a team, you're, you're, you're putting the developers in the driving seat and, and they, they should appreciate this. Uh, they, 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 they will likely like the, the accountability. And in terms with everything we've shown, it, it kind of triggers some growth factor because now they start to receive good feedback, um, they learn new things and, and they get better over time. So mm -hmm. we really think those, you know, those were the two big benefits we wanted to touch base on, uh, enabling incremental improvements, you know, for your teams and, and, and business and enabling uh, developer growth as well. And, um, and that kinds of, uh, wrap it up. In fact, you know, those are some key takeaways that, um, that we, that we've summed up for you, but we, we wanted to, to really make it clear that, you know, developer first does not mean controlling developers before anything. It's really about how can you think of helping developers and, 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 and what kind of expectations do you want to have towards tool uh, for them to be more efficient. Um, Maciek and I have been through this experience that this, this hardly works when it's a top to bottom uh, mandate, right? It has to come from developers liking the tools. Uh, I suppose you, you feel the same, Maciek. Yeah, I, I strongly believe that. Uh, I know when the, the tools or solutions or, or any practice is imposed on the technical practice is imposed on developers, uh, the probability of adoption uh, based on my experience is much lower than uh, the other way around, right? When a, when a developer comes to management saying, hey, I, I know this great tool that would really well fit into our uh, security chain, uh, can we try it out? Or I tried it out during a Friday afternoon, you didn't know that, here are the results, maybe we could subscribe it, uh, or may maybe you could use it, contribute to it. So uh, so it, for me, all of the open source tools that I know, uh, were I, I was introduced to them by my developer friends, and this is yeah. how I see adoption of any type of, of tooling.
Yeah. And like I and mentioned I, before, actually you too, made this point earlier, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm, uh, and that's what I was going to say that, you know, they advocate for it. And that's that's a big deal, right? They use it. They not only use it in their work environment, but also as, you know, hobbyists. And so they advocate these tools. And I think it's really important that that adoption comes bottom up. Voilà, indeed. So we're we're on the same page. Uh, hope you hope you share those takeaways that for, uh, as well. Uh, this is this is all we had for for you all today. Um, happy to take questions, uh, Shireen, Shireen, if if anything, and uh, and, um, and and hope you liked it as well. Thanks everyone for listening. Yeah. All right, guys. Plenty of time for questions here. We have about ten minutes or so for question and answer period. We'll just guide, dive into the ones that we have so far. And we'll see what else we get. Um, uh, here's a question. This is a good one. How do we see the future of quality and security scanning in five years? You need to put on your your little turban and get your little crystal ball out. And so, <laughs> Magic, why don't you take this one if you don't mind? So, yeah. Before I'm, you I'm, lose power again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I hope I won't. Uh, so, uh, before I do. Uh, so first of all, I think that we're going to see more and more developer first and shift left approach. Uh, the This approach where tools would be thrown away to a CI and, you know, all of it would happen there. It's just becoming too too expensive to, uh, to maintain. Uh, developers start playing with some solutions. They spend days, they ship it, and only then it turns out, well, you cannot use it, right? Or it isn't as it should be, or well, it isn't of a quality that we expect. So I would I I do strongly believe that uh, it's gonna be much closer to development. That's the first thing. The second thing, I think that we're gonna see more and more really good specialized tools that become unobstructive. Mm -hmm. When they rise an alarm. You know, you, you know, it's an action item, but they will be silent for, let's say, 99.9% of time. Uh, and the last thing that I think is going to happen is uh, developers will specialize more in their respective areas, leaving mm -hmm. all of the rest to the tools, right? A uh, while ago, you had to know everything. You had to know front end, back end, uh, a bit of infra infrastructure, pre-AWS times and so on. But now we're getting more and more blocks with which we build stuff. And similar to how we get more and more layers of infrastructure, I do feel we're going to get more and more layers of tooling that we just plug in and, and, and go with them. Well, as long as we strongly believe, you know, right. we strongly believe how, how good they are. All right. Great. So that that uh, we may have to hold you to those predictions in five years. So <laughs> do another webinar. We can plan the yeah. webinar in five years. There you yeah. go. It's like five years later. What have we learned? Okay. Uh, Matt asks. Uh, I think this this would be a good one for you, Nico. What do you think about dynamic testing in the DevSecOps workflow? Uh, yes, good one indeed, uh, because it, it, it echoes a couple of points we've made of different technologies and, and different expectations, because indeed, uh, dynamic testing is um, yet another type of security testing, uh, which has its requ requirement. By definition, dynamic runtime, you run the application, which means the application has already been built, it's been deployed in some environment. So um, my answer there would be, um, you know, Surely, there's value for it to be somewhere in the um, in the overall workflow in the overall scheme of things. Because this technology can provide good value on top of other technologies, but you have to set expectations straight from from the beginning. Uh, the example I would give is if you go blindly and you think, "Ah, oh, developer first feedback has to be in the pull request, dynamic testing feedback in the pull request." Okay, but if that means that you know. The pull request is going to wait two hours uh, or even more <laughs> before the first, you know, feedback comes. It's unrealistic. You know, no developer is going to say uh, is going to wait forever for a, a tool somewhere finishing its magic. There are some timing expectations. You know, Kirti showed ID has to be super quick. Pull requests, 
couple of minutes for tools. You're also discussing with peers so a little bit more. But you know, when you reach the or the hours, uh, I would personally think you know. But again, this is this has to be a conversation with the dev team that it would be too long. Um, but this is where having this conversation open with dev teams is, is super good. It's like okay. This is this is the time it takes. This is the kind of input you can get. What do you think? And maybe the dev team will say, you know what? Let's run it every night, and we'll get the feedback mm -hmm. the next morning. And and it's always better to have it the next morning than the next month. And uh, and I think that's the right approach. Um, I hope that makes sense. I, I don't know, Kathy uh, Machek, if you have more to add, but uh, mm -hmm. I I think that would be the um, the, the the way to approach it. Yep. All right. Great. Guys, there's plenty of time for questions. We have about five, seven more minutes uh, open for question and answer. So if you have one, go ahead and send it in. It's not too late. Um, here is another great question. Uh, does developer first mean security teams will no longer have a role to play? Hmm. <laughs> Katia, Katia and I had this discussion. Um, I, I can share a very quickly, it's it's a question we have from time to time, actually, uh, oftentimes, um, especially when we talk about our approach. Um, we, we think it's in everybody's benefit, actually. You know, <laughs> the security teams, what they want is, you know, increased security. So if the developer contributes to that, they, they should be happy. And to, to avoid the elephant in the room, they also should not be scared that they're going to lose their job <laughs> because right. They will get to focus on aspects and things that is their core expertise and that the developer teams cannot work on whether it's uh, you know you know security um, uh, workflow processes or some standards or something at the environment level i'm, I'm not an expert in this so i, I cannot um, uh, claim I, I know it all but um, i truly believe that it's, it's about being complementary and, and not replacing one by the other there and to add Add to that, I mean, after we've, you know, spoken to several customers, you know, big and small, we've also realized the same thing that, you know, it's not just the AppSec teams that handle security and developers don't have a role to play it with, with in it. And it's, you know, hand in hand, co-ownership, so that issues can get detected much earlier. And one thing to kind of, you know, also think about is the earlier you shift, the shift left approach. Um, you know, the cost, the cost to fix is uh, minimal as it shifts left and earlier in the process. So security teams are happier if issues are fixed much earlier than uh, later down the flow. So we've yeah. heard that so many times from many of our customers. Yeah, it's much more expensive to fix them after they've after they're in production or very close to being in production. So a uh, good point there for sure. All right, guys, I think we have time for one more question here. And this one is, uh, I'm really interested in getting the answer on this one. What are your thoughts with respect to the US executive order? Machek, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, because I'm from US, I'm gonna answer it. Uh, <laughs> I probably should start with, you know, it's not a legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> right. No, seriously, uh, I, I do see both benefits and uh, drawbacks of government regulations. I'm always afraid of government regulations because of an over-regulation, right? If there are things being imposed on an industry, uh, usually they're good. But sometimes they create a really big overhead, which might end up becoming a problem for small companies for, let's say, individual developers, they will now have to obey certain really problematic uh, laws to just do their work. Uh, but looking at this execution order, uh, I think it's good because it kind of removes the barriers to tread information sharing between government and the private sector. I know that FBI has, was doing that with some of the companies, but now uh, it is supposed to become easier to do that so that's that's a big plus uh it is supposed to bootstrap the the process of renovating the security infrastructure of uh you know government institutions especially mm -hmm. federal government so i do see that as a benefit as well uh finally someone noticed the open source supply chain security problem software bill of material <laughs> things like that, uh, which I think is also really good for the industry. And uh, what I feel is 
It's not a prediction, but it's just a gut feeling and an educated guess. I think what is going to happen here is kind of similar to what happened with GDPR in European Union, right? Uh, European Union was first to adopt GDPR as like privacy regulations, and then other countries kind of follow along. And I feel that something similar is going to happen the other way around now with, with the U.S., uh, starting this, the opening this debate on cybersecurity, noticing the problem from a government uh, point of view. Uh, I can, I, I could comment on recent leaks of, of Polish government uh, emails, right? I do hope they're, they're going to follow along with that as well. Uh, okay. So overall, I do see this execution of executive order as something good, but I'm a bit afraid that we might end up being overregulated, but I strongly believe that if we come up front as an industry and, and, and say, hey, we want to work with you on regulating this stuff. Uh, we have good practices. We've been doing that for years. Let's let's make it solid. And if that happens, uh, well, the, the outcome is going to be really good for for all of the people using any type of you know IT infrastructure or software. Interesting. Any any uh, any other comments you guys want to make re regarding that or uh, that what Machek said? Good enough for you guys. Yeah, he, uh, he pretty much covered it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's good to know we're all in agreement with that for sure. All right, guys. We are about five minutes to the top of the hour, so unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for question and answer period. I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. There were some really good ones, and so I, I do appreciate that. Just a quick reminder to the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. Following today's webinar, we are going to be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be on the Security Boulevard website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to securityboulevard.com slash webinars and look in the on-demand section. It should be right there waiting for you. All right, without further ado, I did mention at the top of the hour, we'd be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift card. So let's do that now. All right, our first winner today is please. Me, Emma L. Congratulations, Emma. Our second winner today is Daniel A. Congratulations, Daniel. Our third winner today is Katie P. Congratulations, Katie. And our fourth and final winner today is Tara A. Congratulations, Tara. Congratulations to all four of you. We'll be following up with all four of you via email to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see anything there, please check your spam folder. All right, guys. Um, I think that is uh, pretty much for today's uh, webinar. I do want to thank Nicholas Kirti and Machek for a great presentation. Good stuff all the way around. And uh, it's it's definitely food for thought for uh, DevSecOps in general and, uh, you know, useful information for organizations of all sizes. So thank you again. Really do appreciate it. And uh, I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Please, whatever you do, stay safe. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.